Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Crew Network. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And today's webinar is rather unique in that uh, we have invited, it's more of an industry-wide event, and we have invited not only Crew Network members, but also members from other industry organizations. And I'm happy to report we've had uh, nearly 800 registrants for this white paper, which tells me that this is a topic that's near and dear to uh, many people. And I think the industry as a whole recognizes uh, the importance of uh, drawing more women into the industry as well as advancing women within the industry. And uh, we're excited to share this white paper today. If you haven't received your copy yet, you can, here's a copy. You can get it online digitally if you prefer. And uh, for those of you who are Crew Network sponsors, you'll be receiving your hard copy soon. And I encourage you to take a read through. We're going to do some highlights today um, and uh, walk through this and have some commentary from industry practitioners. So on that note, I, I should introduce myself. I'm Wendy Mann. I am the CEO of Crew Network. And uh, I will be moderating the webinar today. Just wanted to take a minute and talk a little bit about Crew. Um, we are 12,000 members strong and founded in 1989. We are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year. Our membership is 97% women and 3% men. And I tell you that because we encourage all the men in the audience. Um, we welcome anybody to our membership. We believe that, um, you know, for us to advance and accelerate the advancement of women, we need to have men and women's voices at the table. And for men who are advocates for women and sponsoring women and committed to our cause and our mission, we welcome you to membership. Um, we were founded in uh, 1989 as a business network. That is our first pillar of our organization. We were founded so that women could give and get business from one another. And for 30 years, that has been our primary goal. And we, ha I have to say, we have seen so much success among our women members um, negotiating and uh, doing great, big, fantastic deals in uh, a lot of the local markets. We currently have 77 chapters in North America, and we have our first global affiliate in the UK and working on continued expansion into the EMEA, the European markets, in the coming years. The three other pillars of our organization, um, one is leadership skills development so that Women are getting the skills and training they need to accelerate and advance in the industry. We also are focused on the pipeline because we can't advance women in the industry if we don't have women. So we do a lot of work, particularly I give credit to our chapters in local markets. They host uh, career outreach programs at both the high school and university level. And finally, our fourth pillar is our research, which is why we're here today. And CREW started our research program in 2005. We are the only industry organization, the only organization period, I believe, that is benchmarking women in commercial real estate. And this has been something that's been really helpful to raise the visibility of what the issues are, what the challenges are, those barriers that exist. And we're very proud of the work we've done so far. And I think this white paper is just another example of us moving the needle forward. Um, so, I think the most important thing to recognize in our white paper as well is that we have uh, statistics and findings that we'll be sharing with you, but the, the nice piece for many organizations and companies is that we put a action guide in the back. So we'll be talking about that action guide as well and how you might use that. Um, so it's not just about talking, it's about execution. So on that note, I will just say that I think that what we've done and what we're doing here today is talking about um, a business imperative for the commercial real estate industry. And once you hear some of the data, you'll see that this is, um, this is something that will help create more um, diverse, successful, and profitable companies within our industry. So on that note, I would like to say thank you very much to um, Capital One Bank. Uh, Capital One Commercial Bank has been our partner, uh, commercial real estate um, uh, partner with us on this uh, research this year in 2019 and we are very proud. One of the things I would just say about them as a partner is that they walk their talk and you'll hear more about their company and, and what they've done there um, in a few minutes, but it's really refreshing to work with a company that is so devoted and committed to this uh, research and that cares so deeply about what we're doing in the commercial real estate market for and on behalf of women. Um, 
So I do a quick introduction. Our speaker panelists today include um, Molly Fadul, who is uh, head of affordable housing for Katira. And she is also on the board of directors for Crew Network. She serves as the board liaison to the research committee. Our, um, from Capital One Bank is uh, Sadvi Subramaniam, who is the senior vice president and market manager there. And, and a very active member of Crew DC. Um, Barbie Reuter, um, president at Cushman and Wakefield PICOR, a former board member and a very active member of the Crew Tucson community. And finally, we have Sean Mobley, uh, CEO of the Americas uh, for Cushman and Wakefield. So welcome to all of you. Thank you, thanks for having us. Thanks. Hey, Sadvi, can you take your, um, we, we're having trouble seeing, there you go, there's Sadvi. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate not only you being part of this panel today, but many of you provided comments within the white paper and are going to be able to share both personal experience as well as your corporate experience in, uh, in what we're doing um, in terms of advancing women. So I'd like to call on Molly first. Molly, can you talk a little bit and share with, the, um, with us about the research committee? Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. So as many of you are aware, Crew Network devotes significant resources towards the Crew Network Foundation, and part of the Crew Network Foundation is devoted to industry-leading research. Um, all of this is focused on advancing Crew's mission. I'd like to take this time um, to really thank the, the Crew Network Industry Research Committee that, that led the efforts in getting this research. Um, released today. The uh, committee was led by Dana Glenser and Jennifer Mazaway. There was a group of 16 of us on the committee that have been working on this report this year since January, and there was a lot of time and effort put in. So I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone that was part of the committee. I'd especially like to thank Laura Lewis and her team at Crew Network for all the time and effort dedicated specifically to this latest white paper. Without Laura and team, it would not have been possible to get this completed. Um, we hope that you find the white paper informative and helpful as you consider all the ways in which you and your companies can advance women uh, in commercial real estate. Thanks, Molly. And I just want to call on Sadvi. Can you make, uh, say a few words about Capital One and your commitment um, and partnership with us? Yes, Mandy. Um, Capital One is very proud to sponsor this research study on accelerating the advancement of women in commercial real estate. Uh, Crew really has been pioneering in uh, publishing research on women in commercial real estate with its white papers and benchmark studies for the last 15 years. Uh, and Capital One has strong support from its leadership. Its Diversity and Inclusion Council is working to create a culture at the company where everyone is welcome, is valued, has a voice, and can succeed. This partnership represents Capital One's strong commitment to advancing women and people of color in commercial real estate. Uh, this is part of who we are at Capital One. It aligns values of best people and do the right thing for the company. And it just makes good business sense. It's where our business and world is heading. For our business to be innovative and forward-leaning, diversity and inclusion are key factors for success. It's also key to access, accessing top talent as diverse candidates bring broader ideas to the table. It makes good business sense as even in the white paper, research has shown that diversity and inclusion positively impact the bottom line and drives better business outcomes as associates that are part of a diverse team prepare better driving better decision making, uh, driving decision better making. Based on the industry research and the crew white paper, Capital One will continue to work on strategies to ensure diverse candidates have equal access to opportunities, equal pay and recognition. This we feel is critical for the success of our business in the future. Thanks Sadvi. We are very pleased and um, appreciative of the support from Capital One. Now I'd like to go on and just start. What I thought we would do is I will talk about some of the facts and findings. There's a lot in this report. It's very meaty. 
but I'm not going to go through every detail. I'm going to give you some of the highlights, and then we're going to go to the panelists because I think there'll be a lot of opportunity to hear some voices and then share your voices as well. So first, I want to, you know, the facts and findings about where we are right now is that, you know, at the current rate of progress, according to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, indicates that gender parity will take us uh, 217 years. You think about that. It's, it, we just celebrate 100 years of the, of the women's right to vote in August, and it's going to take another 217 years to get parity and equality for women in the workplace. So I think that's important. And if you look at some of the statistics here that we put up on the screen that we've put in this white paper report, companies in the top 25% for gender diversity are 15% more likely to have financial returns above industry medians. This gets to bottom line, which Sadvi was mentioning. Companies in the top 25% for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have higher returns, 35%. That's a great number. And then innovation is six times higher at companies with the most um, diverse uh, or most equal workplace uh, culture. And so I think those, those speak to you, right? Innovation six times higher. In addition to that, when we look at women in the workforce, but not in the C-suite, we see, and, and so you'll see here, we looked at Canada, the UK, and the United States. Those are areas where Crew Network has presence. So we chose those to look at. But if you look at it, the percentage of women in the workforce is nearly you know, 50% in Canada and the United States, and over that in uh, the UK. But you look at the percentage of women in C-suite or top management, still a pretty small statistic. Um, so I think that holding leadership roles, we still have some work, to, a lot of work to do in that area. Now, I just wanted to pause here too, because one of the things we did this, in this white paper is expanded it looking at uh, women of color as well. And so I just want to acknowledge that the opportunity for opportunity pay and senior leadership gaps, it's even wider for women of color. So programs will fall short of addressing barriers of gender equality if they only focus on white women. The, you know, we have, uh, have identified, and I will talk toward the end of this, um, about the barriers for women of color and strategies to ensure all women have access to those opportunities, pay, and recognition. Now, when you look at, um, when you look at some of this data, this is really a spotlight just on commercial real estate versus uh, the big picture. When you look at it, um, we know that through our benchmark study, which is every five years, we do a statistical study of our progress. We've started that in 2005, as I mentioned. We know that the pay gap exists. We know that women earn 23.3% less than men. Um, the opportunity gap we discovered when we started this study, one in five women said that family or marital status has adversely impacted their career and or compensation. Um, and then finally, there's good news. The good news is that 72% of professionals agree that uh, achieving gender equity and greater all diversity is a business imperative. So I point that out because I have to say in the three years I've been on staff at Crew Network, uh, we've seen that shift. And every company that I've spoken to in the last three years for partnership, sponsorship has always told me that diversity and inclusion is at the top of their agenda. So this has been coming and evolving over time. So we're at 72%. It's not 100%, but it's still a very good number. And, and I think this is this statistic really moves toward this idea of turning ideas, um, turning into action, where there's going to be real commitment um, because they see it, the business imperative in that. So I think that we'll see more action taken moving down the road. And, the next piece of this is what we've talked about too, is the pipeline. You know, we can't advance women in commercial real estate if we don't have women in commercial real estate. And so these numbers are so interesting to me. We didn't have data for the UK because they didn't break it out by gender. But if you look in this uh, part of our white paper, we've documented that, you know, if you did nearly three fourths of all graduates from commercial real estate schools of their 2300 in 2017, three fourths were men. And so they're a very small number of women. And so we need to grow that. We need to, we need to recognize that this exists, but we also need to grow that. And I think that's what our career outreach programs are. And I know that Crew is very dedicated to that. And I know many other industry organizations are as well, but these are the facts. You know, we need to understand going into what we're doing that uh, we have some limitations and we need to address those as well. 
with you know another piece of the white paper that uh, is really important is this idea of moving from mid-level to senior executive leadership. And I think that um, in the white paper from all of the research we've done is that supporting women moving from that uh, mid-level to senior position is crucial. And it's a, it's a crucial point in a manager's career and that executive leadership is really important to getting them both to the senior level, mentoring them and sponsoring them um, so that they possibly could go into a pipeline for a C-suite position. So in, in he, the statistics here are not surprising. You would say 54% of, of women hold mid-level or associate, mid-level associate or senior associate positions. 27% are SVP, managing director of partners, 9% in the C-suite. And of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the 46% of women, um, or I'm sorry, 46% of women in commercial real estate have accepted a lateral move to a, a, a lateral position with different responsibilities um, based on our study. And I'm not actually, I don't know what that means for us other than women are, instead of going up, they're going sideways. And, and maybe that makes sense sometimes, but I think we need to look deeper at that and figure out, are, is that happening within your companies? And is there something you could do different um, to help them go up instead of over? And then finally, women who have sponsors are 1.5 times likelier to see themselves as leadership material. Now, I want to just call out your attention because words matter. They see themselves as leadership material. So it's saying to me that women in commercial real estate who uh, can't see themselves in those positions if a sponsor perhaps is not encouraging them. So think about how important it is to have that person who can see past what maybe you are seeing in yourself. And I think that it's important that we recognize that. Um, and this is, I mean, I'm talking about women here, but I would say men the same thing. You know, men have sponsors, but when women get sponsors, it helps them see a path forward. And that's pretty much a, a, an imperative we can uh, focus on as we as company executives are looking at ways to help facilitate that transition. And we also took take a look in this white paper because we've seen so much activity at the corporate board level following the passage of the California law uh, that boards are now, um, public uh, corporate boards are required to have women on their board. And there's a whole uh, formula for it um, for California. But generally speaking, you know, um, some of the statistics we found is that in 2018, more than half of the new directors joined boards that had increased in size. And I call your attention to this because I don't think that their boards may not be able to um, transition people out. Instead, they're adding positions. And that, um, that may be the key for some companies in achieving gender balance at the corporate board level is typically um, you might have to add one or two board positions for it for you to be able to start diversifying. Um, I thought this was interesting as well. Prior to becoming a CEO, women are 17% more likely to serve on a corporate board uh, than men. And I think that one of the things from an uh, analysis standpoint that's telling us is that once a woman has that corporate board experience, it makes her look more attractive as a CEO candidate. And so um, we think that this may be a great way for women to find that pathway into a C-suite role as well. And then finally, you know, I love this, the magic number. Um, you know, we often hear discussion around what's an adequate number of women or um, people of color to have on your board to actually qualify as diverse. And so if you think about it, most boards have nine to 13 members on them. And if they only add one, um, one woman, you can't expect to see any real change. Culture within it won't change. So according to the 2018 Global Board Diversity Tracker, yes, that's a thing. The Global Board Diversity Tracker, the magic number is three. You need to have at least three women for there to be significant cultural shift within a board. Um, so there's more on this in the white paper as well, but those are some of the key statistics and um, analysis that have come out of this white paper. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this slide, <clears throat> we didn't put anything else on it because this is all you need to know. And I, I, I think one of the things I have thought about and talked about a lot when I speak on this subject is that, you know, for years I think most um, company executives, and okay, I'll say CEOs, thought that diversity and inclusion was an HR issue. And I think we're finally coming to the place where we recognize that it's a business issue, right? It's a business imperative, it's a bottom line, all of those things. So 
you know, all along, it's been the right thing to do. It's been a good thing to do. But I think that that commitment at, at the top is really what's going to make that push forward. And, and we'll talk some more on that, too, as we go forward. But I think that if there's going to be any significant movement, the mandate from the top needs to come from a CEO holding leadership accountable for um, creating diversity within the company, which means um, getting rid or eradicating bias in hiring processes. It means instead of looking to your personal or private network um, or professional network, which may be all old white men, oh, or just white men, sorry, I'll take out the old, um, that you really, really look beyond that. And, and there's some things we'll talk about in practice that, that we can do. But one of the things I love to see is this waterfall effect of, <clears throat> excuse me, if the CEO is at the top, which I know um, some of my team does not like when I say this, but the fish rocks from the head down, right? So if the, the top of the fish is not saying we're gonna go this way, then the rest of the fish isn't gonna follow. So if we can get corporate CEOs to commit to this um, direction, and I think we have some, uh, namely some on, on the, the webinar today that have made that commitment, you will start seeing leaps forward. And I think that's really important for us. Um, <clears throat> and in this white paper, one of the things we did was reached, we re reached out to a number of, of male executive leaders who have made that commitment. So in the white paper, you'll be able to read more of those comments. And we'll have, of course, Sean here to talk. But we have a commentary from Capital One Commercial Bank, CBRE, Cushman, and Wakefield, as well as Lincoln Property. So I think you'll get a good feel for what the male CEOs are saying, which I, is crucial, of course. So let's get to the action guide. So this is the portion of our white paper that will be about the practical tactics company leaders, leaders can execute to help advance women. And as we say, accelerate it. Um, and some of it's very easy. So the first um, heading is we have what you do as a company to strengthen the pipeline of women. I'm gonna just give you a few examples. Again, there's more meat in the white paper, but um, I think one of the big things is partnering with local schools and universities to uh, make young women aware of your company and um, opportunities in commercial real estate. That, that's what our organizations are doing through the career, the career programs. <coughs> and then, there's also, for those of you who don't know, that Crew Network was one of the leading founders of a um, uh, website. It's called careersbuildingcommunities.org. And I would encourage you, if you haven't taken a look at it, careersbuildingcommunities.org. It's a great tool that we are using at Crew Network, which companies can use as well to educate young women uh, about the possibilities of careers. It's, it's an interactive engaging website. So if you haven't taken a look at it, I encourage you to do that. And let's get that out there. Use that at the career fairs you participate in. Um, the other piece of advice on the pipeline that we would recommend um, in this white paper is for companies to create or to develop creative compensation models to attract young talent to commission-based careers. We know that commission-based careers are very difficult for young people coming out of of uh, college. However, if we aren't getting people in and getting them engaged and educating, we are not going to have that next generation of brokers that we need in the field. And granted, brokerage is, is changing the way that, that things are done and the relationships and all of that. But I still think that as long as we have a commission-based model, we need to get creative about it or young people will not be attracted to that. Um, again, there, there are more bullet points under this pipeline idea. You'll get those in the full white paper. The next area that we have as action items or practical tips is how do, to, what do we need to do to advance women from mid-level to senior executive positions? And so um, one of the things that you may have heard, I've heard this, that <clears throat> when a company is looking to promote, they hire men for their potential and they hire women for their experience. But if we're not giving women those experiences and those opportunities, then, then they're never gonna be as eligible. So we need to also hire women for that potential. And one of the things companies can do is to um, challenge women with stretch assignments, give them uh, something extra that they may not uh, be currently overseeing to help them stretch their skills and see what their potential is. And it could be anything like glo adding global responsibilities or um, leading a business line, contributing to a turnaround or an expansion. Um, those are ways in which we can help women get that movement from mid-level to senior level. Of course, I'm a huge advocate of sponsors. Um, so any way you can develop and implement an intentional sponsorship program where there is accountability. Um, and then one of the other things is um, 
I really like this idea of giving women who have high potential, you know, high potential women in your company exposure to senior leadership meetings and board meetings, because that helps give them a sense of what's happening at those levels, skills they might need that they don't recognize in themselves. But having that exposure, it just helps them start building both the ability to see themselves there as well as uh, identifying things they can build within their arsenal to advance. So those are a couple things in that area. Um, to, uh, ways you can achieve gender equity on your corporate board. Again, we mentioned expand the size of your board. Um, fill seats with people who are not part of your personal network or professional network. Um, and I like this one too, is that creating a more egalitarian uh, culture within your board that integrates the contrasting insights and encourages that diversity of opinion, thought, um, welcome those conversations from everyone. And once you start creating that kind of culture within your board, um, it helps attract other people to your board that want to be part of something that is much more forward looking and advanced when it comes to, to diversity. And finally, um, to end my portion of the, the webinar, which is about the white paper things is, whoops, let me go back, um, ways to advance women of color. And so this, uh, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of sensitivity around this, but I have to say that I think the one thing that companies can do is to acknowledge that women of color face a different set of challenges and barriers to advancement than white women, and that we need to aim for all women to experience equal access to opportunities, pay, and recognition. And if you just make that acknowledgement, it's the first step forward. But there has to be that acknowledgement first, and it has to be talked about at all levels of leadership. It's not just an HR issue. I think that focusing on recruiting women of color from university programs, as well as professional organizations, um, and then advocating for pay transparency. This is a tough one, I know, but um, transparency in your practices, disaggregating uh, pay data by gender and race, and then be willing to make adjustments if you need to. And then finally, the last thing I would say about um, this, this area is, that everybody in leadership should go through unconscious bias training. And that's the reason they call it unconscious because you probably don't even recognize it. But once you sit in a room and, and they start talking about it, you'll say, oh, maybe that's me. I've done that. I've thought that. And so, so don't be afraid of that. And, and when companies start really delivering that and incorporating that into their culture, I think that will help make that change as well. So those, all of the things I've just spoken about are all the areas that are covered in our white paper. And now I'd like to go to uh, some Q&A. And this portion of the program is both for our, myself to engage our panelists as well as for all of you in the audience to ask questions. So um, I'm gonna invite you um, audience to uh, use the question box here in this system to submit your questions. If you have a question for a specific panelist, please be sure to name them in your question and we will go through those questions as we get started here. So I'm gonna go, um, go ahead and get started with questions for the panelists. And you know, Sean, I'm gonna start at the top. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna start with you, put you on the spot a little bit. No, this is not on the spot. So I, would just, I was just curious about, um, I'm gonna start with a softball question. What has your mother, wife, daughter, or the, the woman in your life, what have they taught you about supporting women or what wisdom have they imparted that informs your leadership? Yeah, thanks, Wendy. And first of all, let me start by thanking you and the entire crew team Thank for you. putting together this uh, call, this event today. Uh, the white paper, which I reviewed last week, is an incredible piece of work that I know a lot of people put a lot of work into. So congratulations on that. And thank you to Capital One and all of the people who sponsored that work. So I'm incredibly um, uh, proud to be here with you today. Thank you. Um, a little bit about my personal history on this question. So uh, pretty much everything I know about leadership and winning and um, growing as a, pers as a person and a professional, uh, I learned from women in my life. So uh, my mom was the first in her family to graduate uh, from college. We're from Omaha, Nebraska. She was a school teacher. Uh, later in life, she put herself through some life changes she went through. Uh, she put herself through uh, law school, uh, worked at night, had two kids at home, graduated third in her class from Creighton University, uh, and became a really, really successful lawyer. So 
uh, my life and where I sit today is largely predicated on what I saw, the person that I saw as a mom, as a worker, as a family member I grew up. So she's a, just an un- incredible, incredible success story. Uh, her mom, um, like a lot of people of that age, so she grew up, uh, she's, uh, she was, was raised on a farm, grew up in uh, Omaha, but she was an administrative assistant at Mutual of Omaha. She was employee like number 12 or 20, something like that. And my grandmother started the credit union wow. at Omaha, at, at, at Mutual of <laughs> Omaha, a huge credit union, one of the administrative assistants uh, started. So she had a 40 year career, uh, was a working uh, mother and wife and family member and member of her community in Omaha. So she was this huge impact on me and my mom. And um, the story is kind of crazy though. Her mother, my great grandmother, Moved here from Ireland, was on a farm in Newcastle, Nebraska, like the world's smallest place. They had seven children when her husband died. And um, this was right at the beginning of the Great Depression. My great-grandmother had to sell the farm. She took all the money she had and opened a boarding house at Creighton University, moved her seven children into a boarding house. And uh, the way she paid for the family, she collected rents from kids going to college at Creighton. So that's where my grandma was actually raised was in this boarding house. So I'm a, I have, um, I've had the most incredible, incredible uh, women role models in my life and truly everything I know and I've learned have come from you know, those two. Sean, I almost feel sorry for you that you come from this line of entrepreneurs and, um, uh, you know, rising up from their bootstraps and all you are is CEO of the America. And I got this corporate (laughs) job, I know. (laughs) No, that's fantastic. And I love that. And, And the fact that that entrepreneurial spirit, the inspirational motivation that you must have seen throughout your life from all of these women, that's truly amazing. And how does, how do you think that plays into your leadership? Do you practice some of those same things that they did? I think, I, I, sh- I sure think so. Um, I hope that um, the people that you just heard about, for those of you that know me, I hope that some of that is what you uh, you see in me. I mean, uh, we, um, again, like you said, there's unconscious bias and there's all kinds of things that our company and I can get better at. But in terms of seeing the, um, the potential in people, what people can achieve, the grand ambitions and outcomes that people can achieve in their lives. Um, and it's not a, you know, you don't, it, it's, it's not just one door. You can be great at three or four things you can do, you know, kind of whatever you want to do. The sky's the limit. And we all know there's a lot to that and life's difficult and it's not quite that easy. There's nothing easy about what those three did. Nothing. No. Uh, easy, but um, that's the way I sort of see the world. And I hope that that's, you know, what I, tr- what my influence on the company is. It's reflected in your leadership. Sure. Sure. And I know you guys have, Cushman has done a lot of things, which we'll, we'll get to. Um, so let me turn to Barbie on this next question. And thank you so much, Sean. I, I just love hearing that about those, those famous women. Um, in the white paper, Barbie, you commented that it took eight years and one recession for you to return to your pre-maternity leave income. Uh, do you think the, com- the commission-based structure will ever change for brokerage? And if it does, would that draw more women into the field? Wendy, thank you. And it, it's an honor also as an introduction to be part of uh, multiple organizations represented here, Crew, my firm, Cushman's, that, that uh, share a desire to make a difference here. So um, with that in mind, for my own path, to clarify, at the time that I downramped to three-quarter time, it was a win-win for my family and my firm during the recession, and I wasn't in a 100% commissioned role. But the point for me, and I think for many others, is that when you're returning to full-speed engagement in your role from any life hiatus, it can be like starting over and reproving yourself, even at the same firm. And as leaders, we can do better to recognize our key team members Value, valued roles to their families and reinstate them without discounting their worth. Thanks, Barbie. And Sadvi, uh, you know, I just want to um, throw this out. I'm, I, I know you probably wouldn't brag like this, but I'm going to brag on Capital One. So I was looking at the numbers in Capital One, 53% of your employees are women, 49% of your people uh, are, are people of color. And 91% of employees think that Capital One is a great place to work. Wow. 
What do you think is the driving force behind a company culture that so strongly supports diversity and inclusion? Well, these are very strong numbers, Wendy, and thank you for quoting them. But we recognize that even these strong numbers, the need to work on improving diversity and inclusion exists. It's not something which you can do and uh, be done with. It's a continuous journey and requires a culture change at any organization. Um, I think Capital One is very focused on creating diverse teams, They're disrupting the status quo, and using both systemic and behavioral approaches to change the culture. Mm -hmm. We've got a number of training programs. Uh, we're making a change to public leader actions mm -hmm. and day-to-day -day behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, last couple of years, over 600 people managers in commercial bank received inclusive leadership training or personal bias training. Uh, leaders are accountable along with HR to take ownership for diversity in their teams. Our hiring practices are constantly evaluated. Now we have recruiters who are exclusively focused on bringing more diverse candidates mm -hmm. to the table. Mm -hmm. We've uh, started the Emerging Women's Leadership Program, uh, which, you know, you mentioned a lot of things, uh, Wendy, uh, where uh, we identify high-performing women at senior levels uh, and try and advance their careers, promoting diversity. And as an organization, we've set aspirational goals and mm -hmm. continue to measure progress along the way. Mm -hmm. We want to move in the right direction by creating equal opportunities for everyone. Again, this is a multi-year journey, and we still have a lot of ground to cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, everybody is struggling with getting women to the senior levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Sadvi. Yeah, it, it, you're right, and I know Capital One didn't get there overnight. This has been a long time time commitment that you all have made to get those numbers where you are today. But there, it always it's ongoing, always. So, um, you know, let me switch back to Barbie real quick. One of the action items in the white paper is to advance women into senior executive leadership roles. I, you know, you have had an interesting career path and to be where you are today. So tell us about that career pro process from property management to COO to president. And what have benefits have you seen um, uh, around diversifying your skill set? Can you speak to that a bit? Thanks, Wendy. And before I do, I did not answer the second part of your first question about the commission model. So I want to address that. Please do. Uh, yeah, thank you. Without a doubt, there's a commissioned mentality, and we hire for it among the other values and skill sets that we're looking for. Um, when I talk with the HR leaders at Cushman and Wakefield who strategically look to expand their pool of candidates, they really see that creative alternatives to pure commission may be attractive, and I think you'll see this explored more in the year ahead. Uh, the question you just asked me is a, kind of about my career path, and some of that's detailed in the white paper, so I won't go into a ton of detail. The way I like to phrase it is that I'm a 30-year overnight sensation. Um, that it's my big laugh line. Uh, but I laugh. I laugh. <laughs> thank you, somebody did. <laughs> um, I, I think what's been fortunate for me is that I've been blessed to align, not out of college, but during college with a high-performing entrepreneurial startup and a top performing leader and mentor that has uh, led the growth of our firm into the market leader that it is today. Um, it wasn't always a smooth path going through that career path, but uh, being exposed to uh, autonomy and a growing a division, exposure to the operations side, which really has uh, diverse disciplines, multiple disciplines, is a great stage for uh, for corporate leadership, business development, finance, HR, operations, risk management, strategy. And I think you get that in the asset services uh, world and property management, and it's, it's a terrific springboard. When you are the general manager or leader of a, of a major asset, you're kind of the mayor of a small city. So that's terrific experience, and, and I do, in particular, often encourage young women in the industry to hone their finance skills because it's a differentiator in career advancement. And I think we hear that through the crew world as well. No, that's great advice. I really, um, I can't stress enough the, this idea of diversity of skill set as well. 
for, I mean, it's, it's not for just for women, but I will speak to it as a woman, is that I think that um, curiosity, being curious about how everything works leads you to trying to rotate through different areas and departments. And so if, be curious, not just about your head down working on what you're doing, but be curious about, about what's happening around you in the company and how does, how does the company make money? What does he do? Who, that guy that sits over in the cubicle all the time that people just go to on like a top secret mission, figure out what's going on in your company and then you know, try to move into different areas because the more diverse background you have, the more attractive you're going to be as you go up because you understand the whole business, not just your piece of it. And I think that's kind of what I get from you and your pathway as well when I was reading the white paper. So thank you for that. Um, and so let me go back to, I, um, let's get back to, um, to Sean. Um, what would you tell women in mid-level roles that they need to focus on uh, to advance? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, you know, um, I think what I would tell women in mid-level roles is it's probably similar advice that I'd give I'd give anyone to some degree, which is to build the skills and build the relationships and build the networks that will take you from a mid-level role to a, a senior role. It's kind of what you talked about, Wendy, a little bit about uh, being proactive and curious, right? Uh, you also need to plan if there are things that are important to you in addition to compensation, uh, things like flexibility and work-life balance, whatever it is. Um, get those issues out on the table, make them known. Um, it's not a passive experience, make it a two way street. We talked about this before. I'm a super strong believer. Mm -hmm. There's no reason people can't hold major roles inside the company and have full lives outside the office. Agreed. Our uh, America's head of marketing who sits right through that, right <laughs> through that wall, uh, right behind me. Uh, Adrian Fasano, she's got four kids. They own the greatest bar and restaurant in Chicago. And um, she's running around running, you know, marketing for the Americas at Cushman and Wakefield. And mm -hmm. that's the path she's chosen. And we want to make sure that we get people like Adrian um, into this company. And so I just think being transparent about your expectations, mm -hmm. who you are, be yourself, mm -hmm. where you want to go and have com a candid conversation conversations about that is important. Sean, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing Adrian, because I think that's really important um, for everyone to understand, no matter where you are, if the company culture is right and you have talent, you're going to do whatever you can to keep those people happy and working for you. And so, you know, prove yourself that you're worth it and figure out what you want and get that negotiated into how you work. I agree with you. You can have it all. It's just a matter of how you get that with, with the particular company and kudos to Cushman for, figuring out, you know, it costs you more to replace the talented Adrian than it would to, to keep her. So, you know, job right there. There's, yeah, there's, there's a way. So, um, so thanks for that. And Sabi, let's talk, I have one more question for you, then I'm going to go to the audience. I know we have a number of questions up there and, and we'll go to the audience, but one last question, Capital One's Emerging Women Leaders Program for women in upper management, it provides them access and exposure, um, and information and relationships. So what, can you tell us some of the positive effects your program has had? Um, yeah, it, it uh, started uh, a couple of years ago where uh, I, we identified about 20 women in commercial bank. Uh, it was started with the diversity initiative and uh, for the bank to retain top talent and support them in their career advancement. It created a network for these women in leadership position, women, women who would not generally interact with each other. It gave them an opportunity to learn from each other's journeys uh, and created opportunities for them to move you know, laterally or even up uh, in different areas which they hadn't considered. Um, every one of the women in the program uh, got to go to a leadership development program at the Darwin School at UVA where they spent uh, some time together with each other and talked with a number of professors about diversity and way to advance the same mm -hmm. in the organization and also how they as middle level managers could make an impact, you know, to the diversity dialogue. Yeah, great. 
Yeah, each person was also paired up with a sponsor. That's something you mentioned in the white paper, from the white paper, Wendy. And uh, they continue to work <coughs> with the sponsor. They have access to them at all times. And these sponsors are senior level people, part of the leadership team for Commercial Bank. Uh, and this does works two ways. It gives sponsors exposure to the talent that exists in bank, which they uh -huh. may more. Mm -hmm. And it also gives uh, the talent exposure to senior management and strategies. Um, also, this program, they have monthly meetings and workshops, and they have training from independent organizations. Uh, this helps women to gain confidence and speak up for their teams and themselves. And they also solicit feedback from every one of these meetings and try to make some changes. Obviously, they can't change everything based on feedback, but they make mm -hmm. some changes. Mm -hmm. um, and six of the first 20 women who were in the program have received promotions and advanced in their careers in Capital One. And I think this really strengthens Capital One's commitment to diversity and inclusion and yeah. shows that they're doing something for the talent which is in the company. Yeah. Great example, great stories too. Thank you for that. And it's great that you're tracking uh, the women through the program and where they go beyond the program. Uh, Laura, let's turn to you. Laura Lewis, um, our uh, Chief Marketing Officer here at Crew Network, and she's going to be fielding some audience questions for our panelists. Yes, hi Wendy. We have some good ones here. Um, I'll let you direct these. Michelle asked, as a graduating college senior, how can I be more confident entering this industry? Barbie, can you take that one? Oh, I'd love to. We all, no matter how many years we've been in this business, have that little imposter syndrome thing barking in our ear saying, you're a fraud, you're not good enough, men, women, everybody. And when you're young and early in your career, it's amplified because you don't have experience. So when I started in my career, I focused on lack of experience by being hyper-professional, by being in that uh, inquiry mode that Wendy talks about, where you pick the brains of a lot of smart, successful people mm -hmm. and um, kind of build some confidence through uh, understanding the paths and the humanity of others. Uh, mentorship and sponsorship is something that Wendy talked, o talked about earlier also. And you don't need a formal mentorship program. You don't need a, a formal sponsorship program to uh, ask people to uh, counsel you and to build your own kind of informal board of directors. And as we talk about diversity and inclusion, I think it's important when you seek mentors that those people also represent a broad swath of, of experience and uh, industries, age, uh, ethnicity, all of the above to help uh, guide you on your path. Thank you, Barbie, great answer. And Mich Michelle, hopefully that helps. Um, I would also say, create a little mantra in your head about how wonderful you are. And you are. I don't even know you, but I'm sure you are. Uh, Laura, another question? Yes. <clears throat> what is the best way to get on track to join a corporate board? Mm -hmm. um, anybody, can, anybody on the panel speak to that? I think, Wendy, you're going to have a program uh, yeah. in that regard in a year or so, aren't you? Yes, we are. So um, Crew Network's work is actually focusing on the corporate board piece. Um, and we have a program that I believe is we are going to um, hold in April of next year. Uh, I think there are a couple things that since we've been doing this work on corporate boards and researching it is that you need to be in a certain level position in a company. They re boards are not going to look at people who are uh, uh, in a mid-level position. They're going to look for really C-suite people. The, the, some, some will be CFOs, some will be CIOs, some will be um, knowledge resource kind of people. A lot of CEOs are very attractive for board service. I think one of the things you need to remember about corporate boards is they're going to look for people to fill in gaps that they're missing. So every board is going to be different. So it's not like you can say you need this skill set or that skill set. Um, a board is going to choose you because they don't have you or, or your skill set or your background. So for, you know, for example, you know, um, I know a woman who's a crew network member who is serving on a bank board. And the reason she's serving on the bank board is because when she started her business 30 years ago, 40 years ago, she, that bank was the bank that gave her 
um, her first loan to start her business. And they've watched her grow her company over the last 30 years. And now she's kind of heading down into the sunset. And they said, well, we'd love to have you on our board because you have this broad industry experience in commercial real estate um, from from that perspective, we think you could be helpful to us. Some companies that are failing in the technology area, not failing, but maybe they feel like they're behind the curve. They might look for someone who's a CIO or someone who's a, a senior technology person within a corporate entity because that's what they're missing and they want to be more innovative in that uh, realm. So I think it just depends. I think the best thing you can do is to get great leadership skills, move forward in, in the um, hierarchy wherever you are or, or whichever company you're in, um, make sure you're getting up to the, the top levels and then positioning yourself with some kind of expertise that you have. Um, even though we, we, you want to have a broad background and understand the entire business that you're in, there's going to be something that's going to be a skill set you have that will set you apart from other candidates. And then I think the final piece of it is, is there are now online, um, I, and I, I apologize that it escapes me at the moment, but there's a, um, an online platform or, or um, organization where you can submit your interest in board service and they are starting to track um, candidates for board service for uh, corporate boards. And so, and, and the other piece of it is a lot of executive search firms in commercial real estate search firms um, are being tasked with from companies. They're being hired by companies. And we know this from one of our previous white papers that a company like Avis and Young, they go through a search firm to find people. So the more you can develop relationships with executive search, a corporate board search people, that's going to help you um, position yourself. But, but getting our corporate board training will be helpful as well. So I'm just going to take that moment to promote that as well. Another question, Laura? Yes. Okay. Here's, a, here's another one from Jennifer. So she's addressing the fact that only 9% of women are in the C-suite in commercial real estate. Does this reflect the risk, re risk reward research that we've done in the past that showed that women are more risk adverse than male counterparts and they don't go for the top jobs? And how do we change that? I, I, can, I can partially answer that, Laura, in that I, I think there's been some research that shows that women have a higher tendency to expect to be recognized for their achievements. Uh, so they don't raise their hand. They expect somebody to come and say, hey, you're doing a great job. I want to advance you. So there's an imperative for women to advocate for themselves and to step up and to make their interest in stretch assignments and promotions and client facing opportunities to be known. And if I could just add to that, I think, um, but there's definitely a realization and people realize um, the lack of women in executive roles. And I think if it was just about want to, this would have been fixed a long time ago, but I can't remember who mentioned it. It might have been Wendy in some of your earlier comments. I think if you just look at the way people traditionally recruit for these positions, who's on the interview team and what talent pools they're going into, that's a big source of the problem, right? So if you've got a C-suite that's predominantly of one group, gender, age, mm -hmm. and they're running the interview process and they're working their, their networks, you're gonna have um, candidates that come up who have, who have the same attributes of the interview process and so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we've got a ton of work to do, but one of the first things we implemented at the executive level so he's actually a two-stage things. Number one, for any uh, senior position, well, we're required to have a diverse set of candidates uh, in the interview process. And that one, I, I guess that was sort of obvious, but that was, a, that was something that we put in place. The other thing we did, which was, a, I think, almost a, almost a more material change, is having a diverse set of interviewers. Mm -hmm. So uh, even for roles where it's, okay, this is the person, and th these two are males that are, no, 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 we're going to bring in three or four people on the interview team and get it diverse set of um, perspectives uh, on the candidate. And then you've just got, you've got to measure your success, right? You just, you've got to post up numbers. So we're really intentional about the number of people we have in um, executive roles. It's a, it's about a third to 40% of our America's leadership team is females. That's a, that's a big increase. It's nowhere near where we want to go to. And I'm, and what um, this really great to hear what Capital One has done and the journey that they're on and we're on we're on a similar journey but we're, we're tracking holding people accountable and really changing our process that we think is part of the problem to start with mm -hmm. yeah yeah thanks john i think that's uh you hit the, the nail on the head there and in fact it's 
it's interesting that, that you talk about, I love the idea of having diverse um, hiring panels or um, interview panels. Um, and it's funny because Michelle Hay on your team is the one person who said to me, you know, we need to get away from this idea where we look like to our you know, personal network, our professional network to bring people in. We need to be thinking bigger. So she's one of the first people that said that to me. So she's the, you're following her guidance wisdom or maybe you brought yeah, it. We're, we're in the same rooms together. Yeah. She's had a big influence on where, on our journey. Yeah. Well, any other questions, Laura, that you want to throw out there for the panelists? No, I think, I think that's all we have time for. Yes. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Yeah. So thank you for throwing those questions out. I, um, I just want to say that each of the companies represented here, um, I would say from Cushman and Wakefield has made a transformational effort over the last 18 to 24 months with their Collaborate Women's Network, the Win, Win Integrated Network um, with their women's programs and their Collaborate uh, Conference that they do with that. Uh, I think Capital One has just demonstrated such um, a grace and commitment with all of the work that they have done. And Barbie, you know, it's almost like a personal level for Barbie who has been such a role model, honestly, for so many women who look up to you. And, and I know you're involved with Wynn at Cushman as well, but just from running your own business in the Tucson market and being part of Crew Network, one of our former board members, there are so many women who see what you've done and you are an inspiration. And so I thank you. Thank you all for participating today. and. Uh, and doing all the hard work that you're doing. Crew is very, very proud. One thing I will also add is that Crew Network um, does, we started an internship website last year in a way, in an effort kind of to address what um, Sean and I were just talking about, which is to find diverse candidates. So we are asking our sponsor companies to post up your internships there. And we're working with um, uh, historically black colleges and university. We're gonna be working with the International University in Miami to push these job opportunities, internships, to diverse schools and um, populations so that we can help build that, both women and people of color. And so um, if you haven't checked out our internship website, I encourage you to do so. A few closing comments. Um, the work that we're doing is not easy. It's not gonna change overnight. But we are very much in a space where we will accelerate over the next five years. I'm hoping that we won't have to wait 217 years, but we'll work the best we can. And, and all of us together, the, the, the CEOs at the top, uh, the leadership in the middle, and those of you coming up, so many young women in our industry coming up, um, there's positive opportunity moving forward. So your call to action today is to get the white paper, distribute it to your leadership and encourage action. That's the best thing you can do because the more pervasive this thinking is in our, um, in our leadership, in our companies, the better it's gonna be. In 2020, Crew Network will be conducting a benchmark study. It will be our 20-year um, study, and we will have, following that, um, the results of that, we'll have 20 years worth of data to measure the progress of women. So I encourage all of you, encourage your company, encourage um, your peers and colleagues to participate in that study. We will be working with other industry organizations, including ICSC, um, NMHC, BOMA have all agreed to partner with us to distribute this so we can get as much data as possible for all aspects of commercial real estate. Um, at the end of this, I think um, within a day or so, we will be sending out to all of you who have registered an email with uh, the recording of this session and the resources related to everything we've talked about. So we'd encourage you again to share the recording with people who couldn't be here. And finally, we always like to send out an evaluation following uh, these webinars and uh, ask that you respond to help us create content for our future webinars that would be of value to you. So we'd love to hear from you what you thought of this one and what kind of content you'd liked going forward. And with that, I would just again thank our panelists. Thanks, Molly, for your leadership. And Laura, thank you um, for all that you do to get this stuff done. I appreciate it very much. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you.